we're trying to, to also help students see that there are careers in robotics and flying drones and you know engineering and uh, computer programming and artificial intelligence that are all a part of the future of our food supply and many other things of course but but that we need students who have a passion for plants and technology to look at horticulture as a career Hi everyone, thanks for joining the podcast today. I'm your host, Taylor Schauberg, owner of Active Grow. We're really excited to have our third guest on today. Her name is Dr. Kimberly Williams. She is an educator. She is a very passionate person when it comes to horticulture. She has an extensive experience with hydroponics and growing in greenhouses, as well as controlled environments. And she has some very exciting ideas on how to teach our next generation of kids how to be excited about horticulture and look for the next generation of jobs that are available in the horticultural market. So there's a lot of exciting things that we discuss in this podcast, and we're really excited to share it with you. So without further ado, here's our guest, Dr. Kimberly Williams. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. I'm here with Dr. Kim Williams of uh, Kansas State. It's a pleasure to have you, Kim. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Uh, First of all, I want to say we really are excited to have you on the show. And I know you have a super busy schedule educating all those kids. And uh, we really just we just want to say we appreciate you being here. My pleasure. Uh, first off, I just want to get into, can you tell us a bit about Kansas State's uh, horticultural and natural resource program and your role there? Yeah, sure. So uh, Kansas State University, K-State for short, is a land-grant university, which means that in addition to teaching and research, we also have the obligation to conduct outreach, which is you know taking research-based information to the public to support and improve the industries that we serve. Um, Our program has about 110 undergraduate students that are pursuing a four-year degree in horticulture. And and, um, our research programs span the gambit of horticultural commodities that are important in the Midwest U.S. Um, My role in the program, uh, I I am a controlled environment production faculty. And um, my appointment is about 60% of my time doing teaching and advising, and about 40% of my time conducting uh, applied research for the greenhouse industries. Um, I teach five courses, which are greenhouse operations management, herbaceous crop production, hydroponic food production, floral crops production and handling, and interior plantscaping. So I'm not an expert in all of those topics, but I, uh, you know, I draw on the the work and the research of my colleagues around the country and the world to to try to keep what we we take into the classroom uh, cutting edge. Uh, my research is is really varied, depending on student interest, but it always involves crop production or, you know, that are produced in controlled environments like greenhouses. Wow. And maybe can you tell us a little bit how you first got into hydroponics or horticulture in general? Yeah, for sure. Um, So, I mean, hydroponics is just so cool, isn't it? I mean, we can grow plants without without soil and in virtually any environment that you can manage to provide light for photosynthesis. Um, My story is that I grew up as like a hybrid farm kid in central Kansas. And I found horticulture because I loved flowers and plants growing up. Um, I did my graduate work at North Carolina State University in media and nutrition of greenhouse crops. And um, though I always reserve the right to change my path, it stuck. And uh, I worked with um, an amazing mentor there, Paul Nelson, who introduced me to commercial hydroponics. And, um, and I've been doing it at least as a part of my teaching ever since. And um, some research in particular with like organic hydroponic fertilization. So I, I love the subject of greenhouse production because everything is connected and it's a subject where we have a certain amount of control 
over all of the inputs into plant growth. So um, it really integrates all of the facets of plant growth and development with environmental management. So um, if I was born to be a teacher, teaching horticulture is the subject that I was absolutely drawn to. That's awesome. Um, so totally passionate about teaching. We appreciate that. Um, you do teach, uh, so undergraduate kids, do you also teach younger kids through this program? I'm going to get into it. It's called the Plant Science with a Purpose program. Yeah. So um, I don't teach them. Uh, so, so I teach college students and I have graduate students um, that help me with the research or actually it's their research. I help them with the research. Um, but uh, with the, the plant science, horticulture is plant science with a purpose. So um, this program actually targets high school students uh, in high school, like biology and science classrooms which I don't teach in. I bow to the amazing high school science teachers around the world, but um, certainly in the U.S., like it's a it's a heavy lift to really, um, you know, engage our high schoolers with really fascinating aspects about science. And so, um, so I have, so some colleagues and I. Um, basically developed these horticulture storylines um, around the idea of being able to introduce horticulture as a career to every student in high school science classrooms. So I, I worked to develop the storylines, taking really cool aspects of um, plant science that, you know, we thought would, you know, kind of capture the interest of high school uh science kids and and their teachers as well, right? Like things that their teachers could see really fitting into their classroom curriculum and meeting the learning goals that, that they need to achieve. Uh, but then at the same time, kind of slipping in horticulture as a potential career path. Right. I mean, as a kid, I don't remember much of getting my hands dirty, going into the greenhouse or the garden or much of that from my high school experience. So how do we improve on that? Like, how have you, you know, given teachers the tools you think to like, ex like have our next generation access that? Yeah. Um, well, you know, across, certainly in the U S and, and actually across the world, um, there's a decline in the number of students who pursue horticulture as a career. And so, our strategy with this uh, project was to, um, to, to connect information about horticulture as a career to every student, not just to students who, who happen to be at schools with like FFA or agriculture programs. Like, as, as you mentioned, you know, depending on where you grow up and where you go to school, there may or may not be those opportunities available. So that led us to pursuing a USDA SPECA grant, um, which is a program, like it's a challenge grant specifically designed to target um, secondary and post-secondary education to try to just, you know, improve, uh, uh, increase the capacity of our workforce in these, you know, critical um, agriculture areas. And um, the way that we approach that was to first survey science teachers about what materials they would find useful in their classrooms and then what would incentivize their use, like what would make them appealing for them to, you know, spend some time learning and incorporating into their classrooms. And what we learned is that um, they needed storylines built around phenomena, which align with the mm. next generation science standards. So, so those are like specific terms that, um, you know, is related to how science is being taught in, um, I mean, I can only speak to what I know and what I've learned from, from the teachers in this project in the U.S. right now. Um, but but it's, it's, it's instead of, you know, kind of delivering fact after fact after fact in lecture format, it's more like giving our, our high schoolers like just really cool science um, 
phenomena is literally what yeah. they're called. And then, you know, having them ask questions and make observations and develop experiments around them. And um, so I, again, I bow to the amazing uh, high school teachers who can do this really well. Right. Uh, and I'm really fortunate that here in Manhattan, Kansas, um, we have this core group of biology teachers in our uh, public school system. And my daughter actually happened to be in one of those classrooms and she was coming home and she was talking about like, you know, some of the things that she was doing. And I was like, they're using storylines like this new sort of learning. Well, new to me, right? Yeah. New since I went through school, you know, technique to teach science. And so um, I was really fortunate that when I approached them with this project, they were like, you know, as a group, they were like, hey, we can see how this could fit into our curriculum. And we'd like to, you know, uh, do some, you know, we'd be willing to do some beta testing for you as a part of this uh, U.S. project. So. So, so you go to some of these schools and you're part of the team that kind of helps to try to encourage them to incorporate it or... Yeah, I am. Are you totally, that involved? Wow. I'm totally behind the scenes I'm behind the scenes. They're they're doing their thing with their students in their classrooms. And I like I developed a, <clears throat> a kit right with LED yeah. lights. And, you know, so like I developed the you know, I brought the research to them um, and, you know, kind of try, in, in conversations with them and so forth, like tried to figure out ways that we could, you know, that, that they could successfully do these experiments with light in the back of their classrooms and so forth, you know, kind of right. just meshing what I know about like substrates and plant production, never getting into the, like the, how to teach it, except like, right, right. You know, here's what you need storyline wise. So I yeah. You. Yeah. What, what was one of the cool experiments you did? I saw something about uh, purple lettuces and anthocyanin production. Yeah. So so one of the key phenomenon, right, that we that that these storylines are built around is the fact that lettuce that has the capacity to turn red, right? So it has the ability to cultivars that can um, generate anthocyanins in their cells. Like I'm just talking about um, like your your basic like butterhead lettuce varieties or lettuce that would be grown as greens in hydroponic systems, and there are many varieties um, that will turn red right when they're exposed to um like high blue high percentages of blue light and a little bit of uv light also really helps this response and so if you grow them under an absence of um those light quality then they won't develop the anthocyanins so in the back of the classroom teachers can um, have students design an experiment with these cultivars of lettuce and put them under different light qualities, see which ones turn red, and then figure, you know, have the students like, okay, well, like, why is that? What's going on there? And um, this group of, of amazing biology teachers that I've been working with at Manhattan High School actually have a melanin storyline. So they uh, teach about how, you know, UV levels in the sun have resulted in the evolution of different amounts of melanin in skin color over time. Hmm. And then they pair that with this um, storyline about how lettuce and, you know, other crops will uh, develop anthocyanins as a, a kind of natural sunscreen when they right. are produced under these high blue and, you know, high energy wavelengths like blue and UV. So um, at the same time though, right, they're slipping in some, you know, video clips of here are careers that you can have in vertical farming and, you know, using robotics in horticulture and, you know, really cool aspects of our industry that are being introduced to, you know, students who, you know, otherwise really maybe not, don't even know where their salad comes from, you know? So, um, right. so that's the idea behind it. And where does it come from most of the time? Hundreds of miles away or down the street? Um, <laughs> well, we 
it depends on where you live, right? In urban areas, yeah. there are some good vertical farm options. Um, but, um, and we have actually here in our community, a number of, of local producers, but um, yeah, still certainly when we shop in the grocery stores, a lot of it's coming from California and Florida, shipped thousands of miles. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, well, is there any, what are the, any other plans for the program? What are the next experiments you have lined up? Um, well, with, we, so we, we've been in the beta testing phase, right? And, uh, and I now with Manhattan High in their second year, and we have also some uh, teachers in um, the Kansas City area, and it, so more in Eastern Kansas, we've, we've had actually now uh, 1,100 students uh, go through some iteration of um, the storylines. And so I've taken that feedback, working on improving them, but they are, you know, posted and out there for anybody to take a look at and use. Um, the the grant uh, allowed me to provide these back of the classroom kits uh, for the teachers who have done the beta testing. But, you know, of course, um, that's not possible on, you know, a, a a countrywide basis. So I mm. think that's like one of the challenges, right? Which is like getting the right lights that are going to um, give this, the teachers the responses that they can use as the jumping off point for teaching students these cool phenomena. Um, and, and actually to your question, um, there's another phenomenon that an, another storyline is based around, which is the fact that um, some plants, like some varieties of tomatoes, for example, will develop this funky physiological disorder called intumescence where mm -hmm. the cells like kind of hypertrophy they kind of become cancerous in the absence mm -hmm. of light so um so that's an that's like a separate storyline and you know it provides another option for ways uh, for uh, teachers to like maybe you know when they're talking about say cell biology you know and, and how you know, all of the organisms on Earth have evolved under the, the light spectra that the sun uh, provides. And, you know, so what are some of the um, evolutionary uh, phenomena that have, have evolved because of that? Um, you said in the absence of UV light, there's some atrophy. Yes. Interestingly. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. And I think I saw on the site there was you had a there was a greenhouse that had some epoxy or something and it was blocking the, the UV and it created that kind of funny tomato plant. Yeah. No, replicating, replicating the sunlight is still a technology that we're, we're striving to achieve. It's, it's, it's hard to mimic mother nature, isn't it? It is, you know, and I think when we, we think we've got it all figured out um, and we are like, Oh, we don't need that UV, right. Uh, there are, there are mm -hmm. unintended consequences sometimes of, of, um, you know, thinking that we've got it figured out better than, than mother nature. I mean, one that I always like to bring into my classrooms is, um, you know, when we're growing crops, like say tomatoes in a, in a controlled environment where we don't have natural pollinators and we have to actually bring the bees in, we're usually covering our greenhouse structures with something that blocks UV because, you know, it results in, um, degradation of plastic coverings and things like that. But then, mm -hmm. then we've like manipulated the vision patterns of these pollinators. So they can't pollinate quite as well in our controlled environment. Oh, wow. And it's like, you know, a, a, a kind of weird unintended consequence of blocking UV from our production space. So you're saying that bees have difficulty seeing when there's a lack of UV? Yeah. Um, they they can see in the uv range unlike us and so there are like say take a tomato flower it's actually got like a target built into it and the, the pollinators will be able to see that target that like guides them right to the center of the flower to to uh, harvest the pollen wow yeah. okay that's 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 new <laughs> another unintended consequence okay why do you think it's important that these kids should even learn how light can interact with plants, how plants grow? Why do you think that's even an important thing we should be doing? I mean, we have big, big supermarket chains that, that make our food for us. Why do, why do, why do kids need to worry about that? Well, um, 
I mean, from the standpoint of what got us into this project in the first place, the fact is we don't have enough people to grow that food right now. We, um, we have a, a dearth of folks who are interested in, or even aware of, right? Like even aware of, uh, horticulture as a career. And I'm, you know, I'm obviously zeroing in on horticulture, but it's much broader than that in terms of um, some of the traditional ag fields. And so, um, you know, we might have big supermarkets now with people, you know, populated with, with food that's coming from, you know, thousands of miles away and some local production too, right? Uh, mixed in there um, and, and cool farmers markets and really, uh, um, um, great, like, you know, partnerships between restaurants and, and small scale local farming and all of that is, is great. But, but, you know, the people who are doing it uh, aren't going to be able to do it forever. And we need to always be focused on the next generation and um, the innovations that will continue to come in agriculture. And that was, that's also a, a part of our goal, which is to you know, even students who are familiar with where their food comes from and how to grow it and have family gardens and things like that, don't necessarily think of or are aware of um, the level of technology and automation that is the future of agriculture and food production. And so we're trying to, to also help students see that there are careers in robotics and flying drones and you know, engineering and uh, computer programming and artificial intelligence that are all a part of the future of our food supply and many other things, of course, but, but that we need students who have a passion for plants and technology to look at horticulture as a career. And, um, and so it's not just like, you know, sowing a seed like you did in second grade and then watering it in a windowsill. It's a lot more sophisticated than that. Um, mm -hmm. And the opportunities are really just endless in terms of, of what students are going to be able to do in the future, in these future careers. So trying to yeah. just spread that message and spark that interest um, is the goal. No, you, you're touching on some of these, these jobs that are, that, are coming in the future like you, can you kind of go into more specifics of some of these these careers that these kids can pursue like this drone flying and things like that sounds yeah. amazing yeah i mean and it's it's still you know in the research and development phase but especially because we just don't have a large enough workforce to meet demand there's a lot of focus on automating um, food production and so that really ups the skill set and the skills that are needed for, for the, the people who are doing it. Um, so as crop production becomes more automated, we need like systems engineers who can develop and operate software interfaces between greenhouse environment and you know, robots doing the planting, growing and harvesting. Um, we're gonna need drone operators who can not only fly the drones, but interpret the data that they collect that will do things like help us efficiently manage pests because you know with drones we can get like a, a a very quick scan of you know like discoloration in foliage for example that can help us mm -hmm. really quickly hone in on where there's like a pocket of pest feeding um, we need plant scientists who are going to do things like breed miniature tomatoes that can be grown on tabletops in everyone's home um, we need horticulturists who will figure out how to repurpose organic waste products into fertilizer. Um, I was just talking with a colleague yesterday about, um, you know, using food waste and, you know, having organic fertilizer from the food waste from their university cafeteria and like how that could work as a, as an organic fertilizer, which has a ton of challenges, but absolutely, you know, is something worth, looking at as we need to move towards a more sustainable, um, uh, you know, production environment. Uh, water use is huge. And of course, that's a, an advantage right. of hydroponics. Um, but so the jobs of the future are not so much about hard physical labor, but about being able to harness technology 
to make crop production more environmentally friendly and efficient with less inputs. Um, you know, always appreciating that that not everything is going to be produced in uh, like a controlled environment. There's always going to be a place for traditional, you know, orchards and <clears throat> farming systems, but um, some crops do make sense in controlled environments. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. You, you, you've come from sort of a heavy greenhouse background and, you know, Kansas has lots of land, lots of great soil. You could grow crops outdoors, but then there's this indoor component that's completely controlled without any natural sunlight. Where do you see the future of horticulture heading? Do you think it's a combination of all those or do you think it's going in one direction more than the other? Yeah. Um, well, without question, it's going to be a combination of both. Um, indoor production provides huge benefits in things like water savings, for example. And there are some crops like, you know, lettuce, microgreens, you mentioned brassicas, right, that are perfect for indoor production where we can precisely control the indoor environment and then optimize the quality and the speed with which the product is produced. Um, and even though we have to pay for the efficient electricity, right? Cause we're, you know, like using LEDs now, but we do have to pay for that energy, um, that, you know, produces the photosynthesis that drives the photosynthesis and thus plant growth. But in the case of those crops, we harvest and consume all of the photosynthetic output of that light energy. So we, we eat all of the foliage. So there's an, you know, an efficiency there in terms of what it costs for the energy with what we get out of it. But with other crops, like, you know, take, you know, woody fruit trees, for example, you know, we have to use a, a lot of energy in the standpoint of like, from the standpoint of what we're paying for that light energy to grow a lot of biomass, um, you know, woody stems and leaves that's never going to be consumed. So you have a lot of light energy that's needed mm. to drive the photosynthesis to produce a lot of biomass that's never going to be eaten. And so the cost analysis really breaks down there in terms of, um, you know, whether or not it could make sense in a controlled environment to grow those crops. Now, there is a lot of really cool research um, you know, related to using other forms of energy, like, uh, you know, like off the grid, like, you know, solar energy and wind energy, for example, that is essentially going to be able to um, provide that, you know, source of energy for the electricity that, you know, fuels the LED lights. So I'm not saying it's a deal breaker indefinitely. But in the shorter term foreseeable future, there's definitely going to be, a, um, you know, a, a limited palette of crops that are going to make sense to grow um, in controlled environments. And do you see, I know you do experiments with, you know, the coloration, but what about uh, flavonoid production? Have you seen anything with flavors increasing or decreasing under certain lights or in certain growth scenarios? Yeah, for sure. Um, I actually have a colleague here at K-State who specifically looks at that. And he's hmm. done, uh, Chana Rajashaker, and he's done research uh, in field production with lettuce in high tunnels um, versus the field. And, and actually in environments where the plants are a bit more stressed during their production, which often happens in the field, the stress response uh, tends to produce those, um, uh, you know, beneficial flavonoid flavors. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So okay. for sure. Yeah. And you know, that's, that's a huge plus of controlled environments in that if you are looking for a very specific flavor palette, you can mm -hmm. accomplish it with the, with the control that you have in controlled environment production in vertical farms and so forth. Um, yeah, so. that's amazing. That's that's like the future. I mean, isn't there like some fruits that are out there that are sh more sweet than others just because they were grown in this controlled environment under a certain lighting spectrum and certain, you know, humidity or CO2 levels? I mean, there's just so much to play with, it seems like, in these controlled environments, and there's still so much to learn. So 
I mean, it'd be great to catch up later and, and hear more about his current experiments and maybe share a link to what he's doing and find out more there too. Um, I wanted to follow up with you about uh, a book that you co-authored. Um, can you share share with us a bit about the book? Yeah. So, um, so co-edited, and I, I co-authored uh, several chapters in it, but with some colleagues at um, UC, UC Riverside, University of California, Riverside, and Rutgers okay. University. So we sort of spanned the, the U.S., we um, we called on our colleagues uh, in controlled environment production, and it's a uh, it's water root media and nutrient management for greenhouse crops. So it's just really focused in on trying to consolidate all of the great knowledge and information that we have in a really uh, grower friendly format, an extension mm -hmm. or outreach format um, that summarizes. Uh, how to you know use soil-less substrates and um, the types of irrigation systems and fertilizer programs that we have in container production where we actually don't use any soil. We have soil-less substrates, and so so yeah, it's it's uh, it was a uh, a long process to try to pull all of that information together. But we're really jazzed to have the book out there and available through um, the University of California. Division of Ag and Natural Resources. Yeah, it's like and on Amazon in, and stuff. So it's on Amazon. What's the name yeah. of the book again? Just so people can remember. Um, just so I, I keep looking down at it. Yeah, so show I it on the screen. It. Yeah, water <laughs> okay. yeah, and nutrient management for greenhouse crops. Awesome. And it, you, so you work with UC Riverside, Rutgers. I really appreciate that. Like you're reaching outside of your university. K-State and, and working with other universities, kind of collaborating on what's the latest trends, like, that's great, right? Because, I mean, it seems like it's so great that you that you communicate and bring this stuff forward. And I'm happy that I, I, I think that there should be more spotlighting on this. So so thank you for that and just collaboration and pushing pushing this tech forward. Yeah, um, I mean, there, <laughs> there are amazing scientists out there that are not me, right? For sure, like like that, it takes a team effort. None of us can do it all. And so um, really what makes sense is that we just keep learning from each other and standing on the shoulders of the giants that came before us, right? Right, exactly. Um, so we'll get to the last few questions. You know, I appreciate you so much for your time. Um, do you have any advice for, you know, young people out there that maybe aren't in the program in Manhattan and, you know, they may be interested in starting to grow their own garden at home or like they're thinking of horticulture as a career? What, what do you say to that young person? Yeah, you know, there, it, there are so many ways that you can have fun with plants and just, you know, get experience with plants just to dive in and, and do it. Um, you can get at Walmart, you know, small little desktop hydroponic systems. If you just want to play around with, you know, having a little hydroponic system in your room, you know, a little desktop size with some LED lights. And, you know, these really cool systems have taken, um, you know, a lot of the, the, the back behind the scenes stuff that you have to know uh, out of the process so that it's just kind of very automated. And that's just a great place to start. Um, if you have any little plot of land, you can go to the dollar store and get, um, you know, a pack of seeds for 25 cents and, and, you know, start growing, um, you know, squash and tomatoes and cucumbers. Um, so, so if you have, oh, foliage plants, right? Like, oh my gosh, how fun is that? And I mean, I think the, the, what, what I've, said in the last few years is the only good thing about the pandemic was that it reintroduced gardening and, you know, foliage plants to so many folks who it had just like kind of slipped off of the radar and sort of out of our mm -hmm. culture. But um, when folks had that time again, they sort of plants were, were rediscovered and the value that they bring to our um, environment. So we've been focused a lot on crops that we eat, but ornamental plants and, you know, how, when we, when we bring them into our interior plant spaces and our built environments, um, the ornamental aspect of that uh, really actually, you know, makes us just feel better. There's uh, always exciting uh, to see research where 
you know, shorter hospital stays are measured when plants are in the room or and mm. when you have green walls in a, a teaching and learning space, students perform a little better on tests. And so, you know, just get a foliage plant cutting from your grandma's pothos and, you know, we right, cut on the plants, right? Propagate the plants and just have fun learning. And don't be frustrated if something dies. That's all a part of the learning process. And, um, you know, we all probably learn a little bit more from what doesn't work than from what does work perfectly. Hmm. So um, if you have an interest in plants, uh, dive in. And so many of our land grant universities like Kansas State have these outreach and extension based resources that are designed to help you succeed. Um, convince your folks to uh, let you dig up a little corner of, of a garden or uh, like a patio planter and, you know, get some tomatoes growing for the summer that you can then make some like homemade salsa with. And, uh, and you can draw on these resources that are available. So for example, uh, at K-State, we have um, a garden hour, which is designed to just, you know, answer any question that you have about mm. you know, how to start your own garden. Um, and just tons of freely downloadable resources. So if you look to a university and look for like, you know, horticulture, gardening, Google that and look for university based resources. You can um, be assured that they're based on research and they're recommending cultivars that are going to do well in your location and things like that. So, oh, my gosh, I could go on and on. But and, and, and what about good books? You have a lot of books behind you. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. I'm an old timer, right? I, I, I do. still. I, I kind of came through my education where building libraries was important. Um, but honestly, there are great books, but Googling is, is also fantastic <laughs> and knowing where to look, right? Like that's why I, mm -hmm. I keep mentioning, like if you, if you find extension or, you know, university connected information, you can have great confidence in it. And I'm not, it's not to say that there's not a lot of great information otherwise, but um, when you're just learning where to start, gotta, gotta give a plug to our university extension system. Well, Dr. Kimberly, I really appreciate you speaking with us today. Any other final words of wisdom or thoughts before I let you go? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's super fun to meet you, Taylor. And, um, you know, it's just it's great to see what you're doing uh, with the with the LED lights and, you know, you know, just different. There's just an endless array of of ways that they can be used and, and, you know, getting them into the back of high school classrooms is just one right. of them. So it's really great. I want to help you with that. Let me know anything you need. I'm, I'm here to support you in, in educating these kids. So thank you so much, doctor. And um, we wish you all the best. And until next time. Thank you. You too. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye.